All right, there we go. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us again this evening. Uh, this is our second percussion community webinar, and uh, very excited to have John Mapes here with us this evening. First of all, some introductions. My name is Caleb Rothy. I'm the Percussion Education Coordinator for WGI Sport of the Arts. And as I mentioned, our special guest tonight is John Mapes. Uh, John is the Program Coordinator, uh, Battery Ranger, and Visual Designer for Pulse Percussion uh, and Chino Hills High School as well one of the co-founders of Box 6 uh, in addition to that. John, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure. I don't have the best video connection, but I have a solid internet connection, so we're, we're halfway there. <laughs> there we go. Every couple of weeks, a little bit of an upgrade. <laughs> I feel like I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gonna like a snowstorm. <laughs> there we go. John's <laughs> in the fog this evening, everybody. But, uh, he, he's feeling his way through it to be here with us. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go ahead and start off with a couple of questions that I've put together for John um, around kind of our focus question for tonight, which is now that we're a couple of weeks into the season, um, what do we do about getting the full production out there on the floor? Uh, that's the next step that most of us as ensembles need to make. Um, after that, we'll, we'll talk for a half an hour or so about that. Um, afterwards, what we'd love to do is to open things up for anybody else to join in uh, and ask us questions. So if you're tuned in the live tonight, uh, you can do that by typing in a question in the little questions box over there on the side, and we'll kind of get to those as we can towards the end. And if you're uh, tuning in after the fact for this, if you'd love to send in some questions for the next one, uh, you can certainly email me. My email address is my first name, Caleb at WGI.org. So that's the best way to send all that stuff in. All right, so John, a couple of questions for you. Uh, I think all of your groups were out competing this last weekend. Is that correct? That is correct. Awesome. Um, how much of your show did your ensembles perform last weekend? Um, all, well, uh, all three shows, all three groups, so this would be Chino Hills High School, Pulse Percussion, and Power Percussion, um, all basically performed the, almost the exact same amount of show, about five and a half minutes worth, which in the world-class divisions is... There's, well, <laughs> there's only supposed to be about a minute left, but usually a minute and a half to two minutes are still left of the productions. <laughs> do you, uh, with those three ensembles, do you have additional material that's on the floor uh, but that you've not yet performed with your groups? Yes. Yes, yes and no. So we, it, it's, hard, it's all generalities right now, but um, in, in general we, we push really hard before the first show to get as much show on the floor. Um, it's really important that we can get that foundation out there as soon as possible. And then basically as that first show starts creeping up on us, we have to put the brakes on. Um, because we have to start you know, filling things in, um, filling out some of the gaps in the story, and getting the ensemble to a, a place where they can actually can, you know, perform it uh, at a high level, uh, pulling the metronome out, out, doing all those things. So we, we usually will stop We'll either make a call because where we're going to stop. Like this year, um, I, for example, like both, like all the groups are a little bit different, but like uh, pulse percussion, let's say for example right now, we have all of one, two, and three on the floor, but we have them at four still. Um, we weren't able to move on with that for the regional, but the compromise with that was we were, we've been playing it musically for the past couple of weeks. So we, throughout our schedule, like we do an all-weekend thing, we'll, we'll decide like we're going to dedicate one block um, you know, a camp or whatever you call it, and we're, we're going to make sure we get through the closer, which they've had for probably over a month. Um, but that way they're playing it. They started, of course, by themselves. We played it as a full battery now as well. Um, so it's on the back burner waiting. So that gives me a little bit of peace of mind so that I know, like, this weekend now, obviously we're going to start staging the last minute and a half of the closer. So um, that's super helpful. Then on the flip side with Chino Hills, we kind of did the opposite thing. Um, where we, we knew we couldn't get past the five and a half minute mark, it just, it just wasn't going to happen. But I was able to squeeze in a little bit of time so we had like an extra minute staged. That would happen like a week, week and a half ago. Um, kind of it, just in the, in the relative time scheme of wherever the first show and second show is, but not enough time to put it out there. But we had another minute, so that we have probably have about six and a half minutes of show. And then they're going to be learning. They're learning the music right now. We're going to be putting that together. So we do try to keep everything moving, which is really hard to do. Um, 
because when that, that first show or those show dates come up, it's really easy to stop everything in its tracks. So I, I try to do a little overlap, I guess. And on that next movement that, that's learned and maybe already staged but is not performed, is that um, a choice because it's just not ready for prime time yet? Or is that more of a choice of, well, we kind of have a good, you know, um, a good representative logical ending place for now. So let's stop there because it at least feels partially resolved rather than moving on to the next thing. Um, it... <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, it's just, I mean, eh, I mean, I think it's all the same relative to the divisions, but, you know, especially in the world-class division, I mean, just to get the whole thing out there with the quality that you want, top to bottom, it, I, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone do it. You know, I, I've seen full shows not filled in, and I've seen half shows totally dialed in. I, I, we try to be somewhere in the middle of that, if at all possible. Um, it's just there's so much to, to get in the show. Like, I, and, and if you rush through it and you put the whole show out there, it can get a little tricky because you can find yourself in a lot of uh, positions you don't want to be in, <laughs> or there's way more to fix than you maybe expected. So... We, we, we kind of go with this route. And on the West Coast, people usually people usually have less show than the East Coast. East Coast seems, in general, from videos that I watch and groups that I work with, they seem to put most of the show out there and kind of rework it. And then most of the West Coast try, seems like they usually put about half of the show out there. I think both ways work. I don't know if either is better. <laughs> um, we try to be somewhere in that, like, three-quarters of the way, if that answers your question. Yeah, split the difference. I think that's yeah. true strategy for that one. Yeah. Um, in general, for your ensembles, how many shows or how many weekends of competition do you usually schedule for your ensemble over the course of the season? Um, it's, a, it's a little tricky. It, it depends on the high school and independent thing would be very different um, okay. because as most independent groups rehearse on the weekends. So if you do too many shows with your independent ensemble, you lose a, you lose a lot of rehearsal time. Um, and, and, and rehearsal time slash you can't move on. Like if you have a show that weekend, especially if it's a Saturday show, if you have a luxury of showing up on a Friday night rehearsing, you're clearly just reviewing and trying to get it you know, ready to be put in the gym. So, and then, of course, no matter what, if you will try to do that Sunday rehearsal after your show, it can be very difficult. Uh, the members <laughs> are a little exhausted usually on those Sundays. So that's very tricky. So we'd be, we're very careful with uh, the independent groups to not do too many shows to make sure we have enough rehearsal time. Um, on the flip side, with the high school, it's like it's an extra day. You know, you, you have your week rehearsals, and then every time you have a show, then we, we, we always show up early and do a rehearsal in the morning. Um, so now we have that, and then also it's a, it's a good uh, indicator of, like, we have to stop, and this has to be ready to go. Um, and sometimes I think we all think, oh, man, we can never do this this Saturday. But then that show forces you to be able to do it that Saturday, and then right. hopefully you're pleasantly surprised, or you know you just back at it next show. But uh, so usually, like with with our high school groups, they will go out one or two more shows throughout the season, um, and also they're younger and they, they kind of need that performance experience a little bit more. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so I, I, I guess five or if you're asking for an amount, I think Pulse does about five shows, but that's including like I mean. That's two regionals, it's SCPA championships, it's a couple SCPA shows. So it's actually not that much. Yeah. Not that many performances, which is one of the biggest challenges of WGI, especially versus DCI, where you're just touring all summer and it's just a nonstop thing. Right. Um, when do you, we're recording this February 21st. Um, when do you usually target having the full show performed for the first time? Do you target like a specific date or? By our third performance, or like, what what kind of metric do you usually use for that? At least in terms of a target. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, out here, Western Champs, or I think it has a new name now, right? Uh, the Western Power Regional. <laughs> the Western Power Regional. Uh, <laughs> um, that is our absolute deadline for full show. Has, I mean, is on the floor, and then we would like to. Obviously, get if we can, we'd like to get a show, a performance in before that with the full show. So sometimes it'll be the weekend before, maybe if you're lucky, two weeks before. Um, but the big thing there is like when you have your bigger regional, wherever you are, whatever whatever region you're in. But 
I mean, we have, I mean, Western, Western Power, whatever, we have like three different panels generally rotating through that thing. And it, that's not a time where I want them to see us barely get through the show. Like, I want to have the full show out there, um, even if it's still not fully filled in, but top to bottom, like, it needs to be a good representation of where we're at because I really do need to get that feedback. At that time, you still have three weeks, usually maybe a month, if you're lucky before you know, Dayton or your local circuit, whatever it is. So um, that, that's our goal. But basically for me, it is with, or for us out here, it's get, do your first show, get to that first regional, which is usually a week, maybe a two weeks after. Um, and then as soon as that first regional is done, it's, that's it. It's go time. I mean, you, you get the, the rest of the show has got to be on the floor. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. So sometime in the next couple of weeks, uh, it would be safe to say that your programs will be ready to play from, in terms of elapsed time, I know it won't all be filled in yet, but from the first note to the last note, more or less, at some point within the next couple of weeks, would that be kind of a fair forecast? Yeah, like like this week or this weekend, like it it is absolutely that time right now. Awesome. Um, does that scale differently based on the class? I know you've you've taught ensembles in A Open and World through the years. Um, does that like? whole show or, you know, first note to the last note, getting it out there, does that scale for you based on the class of competition? I think it's exactly the same. I think the difference is we're putting usually about seven to seven and a half, sometimes north um, of that. <laughs> and your A and open groups are putting 445, five and a half minutes of show. So maybe six if you're pushing, you know, <laughs> pushing it. But sorry, it, it, I mean, in the groups that I work with, um, the A class, open class, even the junior high um, we write for that feeds into our high school, they're on basically the same trajectory. They just have a much shorter show. And the last thing we would want is an A and open group, or especially a junior high, to be further back on the timeline um, because those ensembles need it even more than the world class groups to have their show done. I think that's a great point. Using the um the interval times and the maximum performance times as kind of a guideline to help scale your show so that they're all on the floor at about the same time in terms of being complete. But obviously, uh, the more advanced the ensemble, the more minutes of music and show and presentation that you're putting out there. Uh, really good point, John. Thank you. Um, I think the thing that I know I struggled with this, and I think the thing that most ensembles struggle with is once you get to this point of the season, you've got a bunch of show that's on. Maybe it's two-thirds, it's three-quarters, it's something like that. Um, and it's not great yet. There are, there are flaws, there are issues, there are performance issues that you, you want to go back and fix, but you also feel this need to get on and, and to finish the whole thing out. How do you kind of balance the desire to finish getting it all out there and the desire to refine and clean what's already on the floor? Yep. Um, it can be very tricky, obviously. Um, I, I think for the way I like, I like to do it is we, we get that first show out there, that's our first read. Um, and we usually have a week or two before that regional, like I was saying. And that's, for me, that's my window of time. Like, if I need to adjust anything, um, I got to do it then. And once I get past uh, this first regional, once I get to this, basically, we're a week out from, a, from March here. No matter in general, <laughs> it is, I mean, it's time to move on. It, it, we need to get the closer on the floor. And it's okay to have a checklist of issues and things we know about we just have to get back to later. Um, the only time I would, depends of course where those issues would be and things that you want to adjust. Like if you're doing movements one and two and you're about to move on to movement three, but your biggest issue is the end of movement two, like well, now now you can almost use it to your advantage that you're not done and you can, you can go ahead and wrap that up musically or visually or whatever it is so that now you're, you can start fresh in movement three and then not have like a really awkward fix um, later on, but assuming it's not going to be in that perfect place um, <laughs> to fix it, uh, it's, it's just definitely time to get the show on the floor, and we were just talking about this, I mean, you at the regional, and this weekend, it, it, there's a way that the show can progress for the members, where they can be playing the music and getting the drill, um, and you can go back later and fix things much easier than you can go back later and add a closer. Um, with all with all that experience, um, with all of our older years back in A and Open, it, it was like if if we didn't get the, the show in their hands, I, 
they just wouldn't have that confidence and, and the skills that are, you know, that are, there, there's, there's traps that are coming up in a closer that you don't even know about yet. Um, and that's why I, I really like to at least get it out there. Maybe there's no body and maybe people are not even ensembling yet, but we've got to get it started. And you got to, you can start seeing as you're working on it, like, oh, there's something I didn't even consider was going to be an issue. Um, and of course, you know, conceptually all that as well, but at least getting it in the kid's hands is the biggest thing for me. Um, and getting getting the dots as close as you can, all the details and stuff that usually are the issues um, can be fixed so easily, in my opinion, down the road instead of wasting instead of putting off the end of your shirt. Yeah, I'd agree, and and I think this was one of the hardest things for me to get comfortable with, and took a long time uh, as I was teaching. Was you get to this point in the season where it's just got to be a mad dash to the finish line of getting it done, because you can get so bogged down and try to go back and refine and perfect and tweak. Uh, and a lot of those things will come naturally over the course of the season. You'll, you know, you finish the show and then a couple weeks from now, all those things you were gonna go back and refine, they've already kind of started to take care of themselves as the students have uh, built up their confidence and their comfort with a lot of those responsibilities. Yep. So, um, yeah, you can, you, can, you can squeeze a lot of those things in, you know, throughout your rehearsals, and especially if you've already pinpointed things that you do want to fix or change, sometimes what you can, what you think is going to be like, well, that's a whole big project. It's actually not, and then you didn't waste, you know, planning that time into that. Um, and it's, it's the worst part, I think, when you know there's things that aren't done or aren't quite right. It's really hard to compete them. It's hard to show up to that show and be like, this is it. But you know, like, that's not quite it right now. But it's just part of the process. I know, like with, with the Chino Hill show right now, the way, it, ironically, the thing we haven't worked on the most is the very beginning of the show, which doesn't make much sense. But that's just how these things go. And so, even on this weekend, I'm like, well, we don't really have time to get back to the beginning right now. But it obviously is what it is, you know. And but we made sure we got all the way to that five five and a half minute mark, and we'll be able to easily get back to that intro, hopefully this week or next. <laughs> Awesome. awesome. <laughs> hey, um, John, what if somebody's listening to this and they kind of front-loaded their season, um, they got it way out in front of everything, the show's already done because no, maybe they know they've got limited rehearsal time coming down or uh, the percussionists are part of some other performing group on campus that's going to be taking a trip, so they know they're going to lose some rehearsal time coming up at this point. Um, what, what advice would you have for people whose show is done already? Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's only two kinds. You're not done or you are done. I mean, that, that's our categories right now, especially late February. Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of benefit, of course, to having your show done. There, there's positives and negatives for both. Um, but if your show is done, then it is time to take advantage of those benefits. Um, one of the main benefits is you have commentary and reads now that are from top to bottom. Um, and that's, that is the hardest part about stopping before your show's done. Or having to go to a critique and say, "Well, what's coming up is <laughs> like that doesn't really do much," or you know, how you explain it might not be how it even becomes a reality. So, um, taking advantage of what, like, really taking a step back, I think that's the best thing. Once for me, once the shows are done, I just, I just take a step back and I'm able to watch a video from top to bottom. I'm able to say, "Okay, you know, let, let, let's get back to the message of the show. Like, what, what is the point of the show?" What were the conversations we had when we decided we wanted to do this show? Are we doing that? Um, and it's it's really hard as a, when we're all designing these shows or teaching the shows, we get really caught up in what it is, and you almost forget sometimes. I know, often I go back to the, the the original inspirations for the shows, whether it's the music or videos of certain things, and you're reminded like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's why we wanted to do this show, and we kind of like missed that point. Um, this happens pretty regularly. You'd be surprised because we get we get caught up in doing drumline in a drumline show, and you forget about some of the things. Or early on, you decide, oh, we can't do that. I was like, well, maybe you couldn't do it then, but maybe we can do it at the end of the season, whatever whatever that is. But being able to maximize those benefits is like taking a look at the whole thing visually, musically. Now, like all your segments might be fine in order, but does it, do they really make sense top to bottom? Um, you know, just even just dynamics alone, like are there enough dynamics? It is hard to know that when you just have the first half of the show. Um, <laughs> you know, but when you can really take a step back, that's when the whole, the, the, the arc of the show can really 
really start coming to life. Um, visually, you can really start seeing, are we using thematic things throughout the show? Is there something we liked in the beginning and we kind of left it alone? Can we bring that back more in the middle and the end? Um, or found something in the end. You want to, you know, maybe your whole beginning now changes because you know where you're ending, and it's okay. And it's 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 okay to abandon what you thought the show was if it becomes something else, or if you have a better idea. Um, we we we've, we've it's really scary at first. Some of those bigger changes you can do at the end of the season, but they could be they can just be great. I mean, they can be a lot of fun too, and it can become something different. So that, that's what I like to do. Um, Sometimes we'll we'll do things like, does the the big one is does the show make sense? <laughs> um, and you think it makes sense always. We always think our shows make sense, and we're always confused why people don't understand. But it's, it's like pinpointing where are we losing people, where are things not clear, because it's almost impossible for you to not understand your own show. It, so you have to deconstruct it. You know, sometimes we'll we'll just say, all right, let's let's grab. Let's take the script if there's narration, just away from the music. Let's just let's just reread the script, top to bottom. Is this really what we're trying to say? Does this make sense? Or are we just using the script because it was on a cool poem, but it actually, but nobody knows what that is, and and now it's just confusing, you know, the message. So I may have talked too long about that, but I guess it's more about maximizing your your concept, top to bottom, beginning, middle, the end. Now that everything's done, is that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's an argument for um, trying to get it all out there, uh, yep. not in a rush fashion, but really as quickly as you can, because you can't start to look at it as a complete painting yet until you're done with the painting. And so some of those tweaks and those adjustments that you might have made, you're doing it in a vacuum without the context of the whole production out there. Um, and oftentimes at the end of the season, uh, where some some programs and presentations fall a little flat is not going back through and sculpting everything from the beginning to the end with that through line in mind. It's a bunch of isolated uh, events that are taking place without that contour that, that, that weaves us all the way through the program. So the only way to do that is to have the whole program done. Yep. And, and, it, and it, you can pre-plan all you want, trust me. But there's nothing like it is actually done, and what it became versus what you thought it would became are very. I feel like never <laughs> the same. Um, I want one trick when I, when I do these when we do the um, designer overviews for WGI. Like one of the simplest things I do if I'm watching these, these shows for the first time is I just I read the show title before the show even starts. And I and some of you guys maybe been on the receiving end of this, but I'm like, okay, uh, your show is called X Y Z, and then I'm from, I basically sit there and just say, so what, are, what about this part in the show is X, Y, Z? What about this part? Like I, see, I see it here, and then I lose you for a minute. And then was that maximizing the ballot? And I think one of the easiest things people can do is just watch their show and just think, what's, what's this have to do with my show title? And then you might start finding, like I know you think you have to have that 45-second snare solo. Maybe you do, but what is going on conceptually in, you know, within that minute? Right. Did it propel the whole vision forward, or was it, you know, an isolated event for isolated events' sake? Uh, very well stated. I think one of the other things, my impression is uh, that this is one of the most crucial times of the season right now. This like late February, early March window um, in terms of critique. I think the the most value that you're going to get out of a critique is going to be during this time of year because you've got a good chunk of the show on. Maybe you've got the whole show on over the next couple of weeks but it's still early enough that you can make uh, some pretty major modifications based on the feedback that you get. Um, sometimes that feedback is really helpful and sometimes that feedback is, is difficult uh, based on the vision for your program. So I just kind of want to pick your brain a little bit. How do you, during this time of the season, balance the input that you're getting from judges and during critique, uh, either live during critique or based on the rec recorded commentary? How do you balance that with your personal vision for your program as it kind of exists in your head? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, no, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, well, how do I do it now, or how did I use? You know, so there's there's a lot of levels to this. Uh, but we we did talk about this a little bit in person this weekend, and it's more based off of working with um, some clients that I have, some, some our company that buys shows, and and you, and you there's a lot of interaction with A and open groups, and 
often you hear like, well, a judge said this, so we we made that call. And sometimes that's right, and sometimes sometimes maybe it's not. It's it's really hard to filter um, all the comments and also make sure you're not overreacting potentially to a comment. So um, I, I think, well, for me, and I think for a lot of people, but definitely for me, on a show day when I listen to my commentary, <laughs> I, I'm much more emotional about the commentary than I am the next day or the, you know, the following week. Um, so step one is make sure you listen to it again throughout the week um, when, you're, when you're a little calmer uh, about particular things. So, I mean, it's like it, it, these shows are essentially our, you know, our babies, and for someone to not get it, 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 your first reaction on many of us were like, I can't believe they don't get it. But then you go back on Monday or Tuesday, and you're like, okay, let me let me see why they didn't get it, you know? Or, and that's and then usually the commentary feels so much more calm, even from the judge's end, when you listen to it a couple of days later. Um, so we try not to react too much or make a call too quickly based off of maybe one comment if we feel pretty strongly not against the comment, but just. We did this for a reason, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to overreact to that comment. Um, however, <laughs> when you go to that next show, and then you hear the same comment from a different judge, that is absolutely the time, you know, for the the concern to be drawn. So, <laughs> and and it's not all. It's it's it's. I don't know how to explain this. Um, the, the judges, the, they're seeing a show for the first time, and it's one read, and. It, it kind of goes by typically pretty fast. So they're, they're never going to have all of the answers or all the insight that you have about your show or maybe someone that's coming in to work with your group or at a rehearsal. Um, but at the end of the day, like that commentary is, that, that is so valuable because it is just what they get on a first read. Um, and, it, and it can be difficult for us. And a lot of times, you know, all of us, I, I know it's not just me. We go into the critique, we're like, no, 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 but you don't see you don't see what we see, it's, you know, and it's more like not pointing the blame at them, but then eventually you realize, well, maybe there, maybe there's something to this. Um, but the main thing is the filter and understanding. Is, I think it's the hardest part of, of choosing when to make a change based off just just the commentary. Um, I mean, I, of course, we get comments all the time. We're like, yep, I absolutely agree with that. I haven't even thought about it, but now that you've said it, I fully agree with it. There's not even a question, and now my show's better. But then you have the, you know, you can have the opposite reaction, like, man, I really don't want to change that. Now what do I do? And usually we'll, you know, we'll be aware of it. We'll put it on the checklist, um, and then we'll see what the next read is, you know. And then if if it doesn't seem to be a thing later, then we'll, we we stick more to our guns. But no matter what, if enough people are sounding the alarm, it's definitely a time to address the situation. I know in my experience, um, there were times where sometimes I went with my gut on something, um, and it definitely paid off. It was it was contrary to the other input that I was getting, and when all was said and done, I was really thankful that I did that uh, because it came to fruition the way that it existed in my head. I also know that there were times where I didn't, uh, and I went with my gut, and I really regretted it down the road as I realized that I was not um, uh, reflecting upon that quality information that I was getting back. Uh, and that there's some really valuable stuff that would have made the program better. So um, I think one of the secrets to that is uh, being open-minded uh, and then also just gaining a lot of experience doing this a lot, having a lot of programs, um, uh, you know, taking a lot of presentations out to the floor and culling all of that knowledge that you get by doing that. Um, I think it's also really beneficial to tap into other people that have that experience, you know, trusted friends and mentors and things like that that can give you a little bit of insight along the way. And certainly the judges play a huge role in that. Uh, but sometimes they're filtering it through criteria, getting that one read in isolation. Um, and so that's really valuable, but sometimes it, um, it may be equally valuable to get that input from another resource, somebody else is, that's there. John, do you have any thoughts on, on reaching out and, and maybe getting some of those other kinds of signals and things like that? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> there's the, for, for me, a lot of the time, um, the judge's commentary is always helpful, of course, but the things that I, I catch a lot, even just like what you kind of mentioned right there, for me, when I'm at a competition and I, I just talk with my peers, and it's a, it's a quick, you know, sometimes I'll be like, I have the luxury of having Caleb with my, 
my shoes. <laughs> but it's like, you know, they'll just walk up and be like, interesting use of this and that. And I'm like, nice. And, and that one comment can mean so much because he's sitting in the gym without worrying about numbers or a specific caption. Um, talking with your friends. I mean, the other, your other instructors. Um, in California, it's very open. Everyone's very cool. And we just immediately after shows, everyone's just talking, man, I really like what you did there. I really like what you did there. Oh, could switch up from last year to this year. And it's just a very open atmosphere. And I feel like I get a lot of my, um, I guess, feedback just from just from peers at shows or, you know, at the hang afterwards. Um, and I, I think that's very valuable as well. I think like you said, or like we were, I guess we were saying, um, a, the judge's viewing is so limited to that, you know, six minutes of show plus a minute maybe a wrap up, and then then it's gone. Um, and and it's I think that it's very helpful for for pinpointing problems, but for solutions it can be much more difficult. And and then that's usually what we run in our issues. You know, someone points something out, and we're like, I think we agree with that, but I don't know I don't know what to do about that. Um, and you can read, you know, there's a lot of resources and a lot of people you can reach out to, um, you know, peers, for example. Um, I mean, WGI does a thing now, right? So where you can, I don't know what it's called, where you can get a designer or maybe even like judge input. What is that called? Uh, WGI one-on-one -on -one is that service yeah. where you can upload your show and either get some judge feedback from one of the WGI roster judges or from other uh, design experts uh, in the activity get a little bit more of a fully fleshed out synopsis of your program and, and detail yeah. and some things like that. I mean, so so that 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 for me is so valuable. Um, we we I know like Tim Fairbanks, I think he does that too, but sometimes you know, I know he does like a whole almost side business doing this, and it's very inexpensive, very surprising actually. And when you can have someone sit and watch your show and run commentary to it. But they have the opportunity to watch your video a couple times, uh, be able to pause, rewind, point and click. The feedback from that, it's like getting a judge's read almost four or five times, but within one sitting. So I, even now, I mean, even nowadays, I'm like, hey Tim, you want to run a video? You know, and it's it's awesome, and it's cool that we're able to do that too. But um, that that's one of my biggest things. When like if I'm if, if people send me a video, um, I'll. I'll run it. I mean, it's it's just so helpful, and it's just not that hard to do. It's just a fresh set of eyes. It doesn't mean they're right or wrong. I think that sometimes the hard part is you ask someone to help you. It could be a really good friend, but you disagree. So now do you feel like you have to, you know, you have to do it? And it's like, no, it's your show. It's it's okay. It's okay to keep it the way it was. But there, and you'd also be surprised whether you do it through WGI or guys like Tim. I mean, you could just, it's. People will help more than people realize, um, and it's almost surprising how much you reach out to someone like, "Hey, man, can you watch this video for me?" And I mean, I've, we've done this so many times over the years. Like, I just can't see it. I know what the problem is, but I can't. I don't have the solution. I'm, I'm fed up. And then you know, a fresh set of eyes watches it, and they go, "Well, you know," and all of a sudden, it's like, <sighs> "There it is." Once again, I. Can't. I always, I always talk about, I wish I could see my shows the way anyone else can see my shows, because I can only see them in a certain way, which is not the same as everybody else. So <laughs> it never can be. Um, so those resources are huge digitally. Um, we talk about a lot of the times, like, there's a lot of programs don't have money to fly people out. That's why the, the video thing is great. Um, to work with your group. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of money. Um, but there's a lot of resources people have they don't realize through, like even just their high school marching band. Um, if you're having visual problems, you know, sometimes the drill rider from your marching band, you don't want to come in. Uh, maybe it's more of a movement thing. Maybe it's, hey, you know, if you ask your color guard instructor, hey, can you come in for an hour to check something out? They're probably going to do it. You know, they can probably squeeze it in. And we, we started doing this at, at Chino Hills a couple years ago, and I, it's like, hey man, I know you're really busy, but would you mind coming in? And he was like, yeah, that'd be fun. And he came in and staged some things for us, and it was like, this is this is awesome. And there's a there's a care within the program that's because we're all we're all doing the same thing in the fall. We're all working together in the fall, so why wouldn't we help each other in the winter? And we've done things like cut music for the color guard, and, you know, those sort of things. But um, fresh eyes and like, especially on the visual side, having people that can speak visual and teach visual. Since at the end of the day, most of us are percussionists, 
living in this new visual world, trying to figure out how to get our kids to do what other kids are doing. It doesn't mean you have to fly someone in, some fancy choreographer. There's, there's usually people around that would be willing to come in and help out a little bit if you just ask. Um, another, another one that seems so obvious, but I, I think most, I don't know, a lot of programs, at least out here, it's higher drum instructors teaching the drum lines. Um, being able to bring like, hit your band director to drum line rehearsal. Most drum techs, including myself years ago, would have said, you don't play drums, you can't help. And in fact, we would go to the distance of, please don't. Like, hey, when they're in class, please don't talk to the drum line because we're the experts. And uh, I remember years back, I had, a, I had a band director. He was like, hey, man, or the kids were like, you know, he was, well, so, Mr. So-and-so told us to do this. And I was like, all oh, mad. And I went and talked to him. And he's like, well, I, I was just listening to the pit, and I, I couldn't hear the melody. I was like, huh. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Oh, because you do sit in front of like a full ensemble every single day and, and balance the melody to, to all the different things going on in the music. And it was like, hey, maybe you should come out to a rehearsal. You know, and, and things like you have a band director telling you, you know, those bass drum smash hits and those cymbal smashes are just super loud. And the drum tech in you says, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, you don't know. And it's like, oh, wait, no, he does know music. Um, and of course, your band director will come to a rehearsal with you. <laughs> ask him to come out. And especially because we live in our own universe. We're standing in front of the percussion voices all the time, and we fall in love with the parts of show that we've already fallen in love with. So uh, sometimes those fresh ears from a non-percussionist, just a great musician coming in and listening to it as a musician, um, can really kind of tweak your perspective on a couple of things. Because they don't, they, they're not in love with each one of the passages and where you've decided your ears are going to go in each one of those. So I think that's such valuable information. I'm glad that you shared that. Um, I'd like to back up to something John shared a couple of minutes ago. If I heard him right, uh, everybody, John wants you to send all of your performance videos to him. So exactly. Give you feedback for all of that stuff. Just send it to uh, john at napes.com and Napes. right back to you with uh, a full breakdown of your program, Strengths and Weaknesses. <laughs> Thank you so much for offering that. I know everybody's going to appreciate it a lot. It's like hypothetical. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, John also said, you know, sometimes it's expensive to fly people out and to get that one-on-one -on -one consultation. Whenever you can, it's beneficial, but absolutely it's expensive to do so. So don't, um, don't look beyond some of your local resources. The people that, uh, that you can bring in locally that, that wouldn't cost that, um, that can come in and give you a little bit of perspective, that'd be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, that said, if you live in an exotic location, and John and I are both available to fly in, we would love to work with your ensemble. You just got to let us know. Uh, we're very flexible. Rates are very reasonable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, we got a couple of questions that came in that are kind of on the subject that we're talking about right now, which is critique and stuff like that. Uh, and then I've got a couple more questions for you. But since we're on this topic, right now, I, hope, I hope they're not questions from judges. No, they're not. Uh, so, uh, there's a couple of disgruntled. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Chad was wondering, what are the big questions that you have for the show panels going into critique early on in the season? Like, what are the big things that you think of in your head that I definitely want to go in and talk about this, or uh, questions that you that you might have for judges at this point in the season? Hmm. Uh, man, I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how to answer it because it, it's so varied on the commentary. Um, well, I mean, step one is listening to the commentary. And, and our critiques are reacting to that specific set of commentary. Um, my, my biggest goal at every show, especially in the beginning, is to make sure the concept is clear and to, and to ask, did you understand what we were doing, and being OK if they say no, um, and not just say, well, you know, what's wrong with you? Um, but it, going back to that, um, so if they, if they don't get it, I, I try to pinpoint what's going on. I think. Uh, for me, I don't, I, I don't like to get caught up in really any, I don't want to say any details, but many details and critiques. Um, and I know it's, it's the judge's responsibility, it's their job, they're all looking at, at, a, at a slice of the pie, so some of the commentary is, you know, watch your foot timing, or watch the way you come out from these backdrops, and I'm like, okay, okay. And when, when I go into critique, I'm like, I get it, we're going to get to the, the way we get out of the backdrops. Um, sometimes... I, I want to like double check like 
but did you catch, let's say visual judge, did you catch all the choreography we did right before we went behind the backdrops? And sometimes we're like, yeah, yeah, I just didn't say anything about it because this caught my eye. And I'm like, okay, then, then, then we're good. That makes sense. And I, and I want to make sure I want to make sure it's it's it, what it seems like. And Caleb, you you judge, you've judged quite a bit. Um, I feel like maybe you you can help answer this. Judges are seeing a lot more than they're saying, and that's what I learn in critique quite a bit. Would you say that's true? Uh, absolutely. My eyes and my brain can move much more quickly than uh, my mouth can articulate all of those things. I think um, one of the things that you get from judges is you get this running dialogue of observations, but there's you know there's ten pounds of stuff uh, that goes in addition to all of that, and there's stuff that that um, you know that goes into the assessment that that may not be articulated um, as specifically just because there's so many criteria, uh, there's so much to keep track of over the course of that program. So um, often, what's articulated are the things that the judge felt were most um, uh, most prudent to articulate and to share back to the group, but that may not be the totality of the assessment. So if there are there are things in there that you didn't hear a response to, I think the critique, especially early season, is a great time to probe uh, a little bit more and for a little bit deeper in some of those areas if you didn't get all the insight that you were looking for. I just I think my cat just jumped onto the screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, it's not. Uh, okay, yeah. I was got track. But um, I I think that's my biggest thing is is when I'm listening to commentary. And, and, you know, no matter what, you're always like, why didn't they catch this, 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 and this? And then it seems like most of the time when I go under critique, they're like, well, yeah, of course I saw that. And they're, what they're trying to do is, to, is give me help. They're trying to, I'm trying to help you with the little things that do stick out, the little transition errors and these and these things, but of course I got it. Um, so that, that's my biggest struggle, I think. But I, I just I don't try to get caught up in any of the details, the small details in the show, or the small, the, the analytical things like, yes, the snare solo was not great on that rep. I, I, I want to talk about more important things than that. Um, just demand, and is this achievable, and is it you know, musical? Is it, you know, there's, there's so many things that we can talk about. But the biggest one is, is just concept and top to bottom because it's that fresh read once again. And then, and then getting a chance to, if they didn't get it, obviously like explain it to them. I mean, that's... That's a huge part of it, and there's a lot of light bulbs that go off in critique. Um, so it's a very, it's a very beneficial experience. So I'm not sure if I answered the question exactly right, but no, I think you did. I just want to piggyback, Chad. One other thing uh, that I want to share from my own experience is that um, I didn't have early season big questions that were like boilerplate things that I wanted to talk to the judges about. I tried to make it based on the insight that I got from that particular performance and from the commentary that day. But early season, I was focused on big picture stuff as much as possible. Um, I was focused on trying to uh, have a series of planned events that I was hoping the audience and perhaps the evaluators would react a certain way to. And if they're not having those reactions early on, I wanted as much information from the judges as I possibly could. Um, because I knew that was going to be the stuff that was valuable for me in the long run. Not the, um, not the nuts and bolts stuff. The, you know, like, oh, there's, you know, there's foot timing issues. Yeah, there's... There's clarity issues, there's balance issues, yes, and I, I, I expect the judge to comment on that because they're evaluating all of those things about the performance. But when I got to critique, I never wanted to discuss that stuff early season. Uh, it was much more macro th things, uh, things that were central to the show working or not working, both now and down the road. So, Chad, I think those are the biggest things, uh, not a list of questions, but kind of a mindset of how you want to utilize your critique time early season. Um, Grant has kind of a similar question, and, and John, I think you already kind of touched on this a little bit, but Grant was wondering um, if you have questions planned for your critique before the day of the show, or if those conversations normally are reactive to the commentary and the run of the day. Um, Grant, I would say for me, it was always uh, kind of a mindset I had prior to the show, like here's the, here's the stuff that I need out of today's performance in terms of the feedback. Uh, and then I was going to listen very carefully to that commentary, and that would help sculpt how I wanted to use those three minutes. Um, John, what would you say your process is typically for that? Um, I, I don't feel like I have predetermined questions. Um, I, I'm work, we're working on the show, working with the kids, with the members, and 
I, I, for me, it's all based off of the commentary. Um, and I, I mean, I know what I think is my strengths in my program. I know what I think is my weaknesses. Um, and it's and it, it's okay to agree. You know, sometimes you know, oftentimes, the, the really good judges they they know exactly what your weaknesses are. And it's like, yep, I can understand that. We, we still have time for that. But for, it's really just based off the commentary. I, I think it's the same question. Or sometimes there's. I think one of the best parts about critique too is is when the judge is actually not talking very much. Um, and that's okay, because that means they're really watching. So then you, that's your opportunity to really make sure that they were with you the whole time. I, and I think I, that's kind of related to another point I wanted to make, which is uh, for everybody out there, critique is the instructor's time. It belongs to the instructors. Um, and that's time for you to utilize in whatever facet you want with the adjudicator. So, the number one thing we can do is to make sure that we arrive to critique very well prepared. So, uh, Grant, to respond to your question, um, I would listen to the commentary and then use that to come up with kind of the list of questions or, or what my game plan is for, for critique. I think the most important thing is um, that step between when you listen to your commentary and when critique begins where you actually map out what are the questions that you have, how do you want to spend your three minutes. I want to talk about this for a minute. Uh, I want to talk about this for 30 seconds, but no more than that because I know I have to get onto this topic for a minute 30. That kind of stuff I think is the most important step for us um, is to plan that out ahead of time and make sure that you've kind of budgeted your time wisely to have as productive a dialogue as you possibly can. Yeah, and and, and by by doing that, you are making sure you, you don't get caught up in things that, that aren't necessarily as important. Um, I think that's the... My, my, my biggest frustration in, in critiques is usually that we end up talking about small details or like one thing and we get stuck because it's only three minutes so you can get stuck on it for so long and then you hear that like next You're like next after we didn't even talk about like the three super important things that I want to make sure you know you, he's aware of her so it is important to like write those things down and you don't want to you don't want to cut people off but it is your time, and it is really important to understand. And and sometimes you know the judge will talk the whole time, but it's it's okay to interrupt and say, "I totally hear you. I, I only have a minute, and I want to talk about these two things." And it, that's okay to do because it's it's our time. Absolutely. Hey, John, I want to change gears just a little bit and talk about something a little bit more macro. Um, uh, over the years, you've been in this activity for quite some time, and I know you're most well known for Pulse and Chino Hills and Pow which are all premier world-class ensembles. Um, but you've taught a lot of A, open, and world-class groups through the years, both designing for those and also standing in front of the ensemble and teaching them day to day. I know you still do a lot of design work and, and consultation work with A and open groups as well, uh, and we just don't see that quite as publicly because the groups that you teach now are, are kind of at the forefront of uh, a lot of the world-class things. Can you give us a little bit of insight into how you approach writing and designing differently for A, open, and world paradigms? Yes. How much time do we have? But, uh, I mean, the, the main thing, I mean, world is very different than A and open um, as far as your goals. Your, your goals in world class are to be the best of the best, and your hope is to change the activity. So that is, that is a very big goal. Um, a and open is the majority of most term lines, and it's it's just a very different way you would write a show. It's it's you're you're trying to make your members look the best they can possibly look, because you don't if you're in A and open you shouldn't have all advanced members, so you're trying to make your intermediate and basic members look the best they can, and it's it's so it's really important what you choose to give them to perform. And I, I think everyone knows about. The genius of A open and world in a in W Giant, you can absolutely you can be absolutely successful, you know, playing the correct skill sets. In fact, you're you're supposed to be. So um, the biggest thing, it's like for me, I we talked about um, length of show. Length of show is is huge. If you're an A class ensemble, you're fighting for every note. Um, why would you do a five and a half six minute show? I, why not do five tops? You know, it's so there's like step one is just being smart about the time and if, if the goal is to be perfect top to bottom, which it is, 
make that show as short as you can. Technically, it only has to be four minutes. So there's been some four and a half minute shows that have you know meddled at WGI. So it is interesting to know that. Um, and you know what? What are the sometimes? What are the biggest differences? Sometimes it's just tempo. You know, it, you're not expected to be running around at 200 in A class. Um, so like when like when I'm writing an A class show, it's it's the tempos are more moderate. You know, it's there's we're not all drumming all the time, and we we space things out. So it's a little it's a little more smart, I suppose, um, to that they have an opportunity to get it all. Um, like my, those Pacifica days, that was a that was a, that was a challenge. It was fun, but it was a challenge, and we we really worked. It was like every note was a was a situation, and we had to be really smart about what we chose to give them. Of course, you're going to take risks, and, and you should take risks, but you don't need to take unnecessary risks. Um, the other thing about that is like being really smart about once the show's on the floor. It, I feel like we, we write the notes hard or easy, whatever it is, but it all changes in real time once the, once the, the members are performing it and you're out there. And sometimes it's like, we can do more than this. And sometimes, most of the time, that's not very necessary because we're running across the back of the floor and I, you know, all those dense rhythms, they're not even reading uh, and just being, making smart decisions. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to say how to say it, I guess, with the A and open thing exactly. A and open are a lot more similar than people think they are. I think. I think that's safe to say. Um, when I'm when I when I'm running an open show, there are there are some advanced moments. They're short, but they are there and they're exposed. Um, I think that's the, the biggest difference. They're not super advanced. They're just they are advanced, but the meat of the book isn't. So what that does is now they're intermediate players. So they they have they have more skills. Um, but no no and all intermediate ensemble has enough skills to achieve the entire show um, if it's beyond their grasp. But you can obviously, you know, that feature, that's your moment, that's the thing you work on all the time. You have, you have a setup for it and it might be might just start becoming a little bit more advanced than your intermediate, but that, that's okay. It's just about how many times you do that. Um, I think that's the big one. Even with um, Cypher, Cypher High School from Texas, we, we write for them. Um, I, I mean, I think it was a five five minute fifteen show last year. It was, you know, they they meddled in open class, and it was very interesting. It was very on purpose, and there was definitely moments where they had to they had to really work it out, and then there was other moments where it was it was straight intermediate. So, I, mean, I don't think we ever went too fast. With those tempos, and we were able to like really maximize the visual and give them times to do that. So I don't I don't know if that helps. I, I guess for me, it's tempos, length of show. Like those two things are just huge. Yeah, I think for me, when I'm looking at it, the most important factor is um, giving skills and concepts and ideas to your students that you know they're going to be able to maximize. And I think, John, you touched on that so well at the beginning of, you know, your job in those classes is to try to make your membership look great. Uh, and so that's to take your very best members and put them at the forefront and give them things that uh, really allow them to shine. And that's to take all the members that are struggling and are not as well developed and give them things that they're not going to look like they're struggling with and struggling through but to give them things that they can perform confidently, they can perform consistently, uh, and then ultimately things they're going to be able to have a great experience with. I think the sweet spot is uh, picking all of those moments, making your show you know, 90% that, and then making the show, as John so well stated, 10% uh, that is a little bit outside that, you know, in the zone of proximal development where students can stretch out a little bit and, and learn to achieve something a little bit higher. Um, where I see uh, ensembles really struggling is when they get outside of that like 90%, 10% ratio and it starts to become 50% stuff we can handle and 50% stuff that's, man, it's tough, like they're just holding on for dear life. Uh, I know the educator in me has never felt like students grow the most when they spend half their time doing something that they feel comfortable with and half their time just feeling a little overwhelmed and, and outside of that zone. So I, I think that's really good advice. Uh, and I think in terms of designing for those classes, show length is incredibly important. Um, uh, Ability-driven skills is so incredibly important. And then just also uh, realistic ambition. 
you know, uh, doing something that's going to be uh, well achieved by the students rather than what I wish they could achieve. Or, you know, if only I had these kinds of students, then they'd be able to bring this idea to life. Well, you know, yeah. so don't go down the path. Of that. I feel like I feel like most. I always, whenever I watch any groups, I always assume. I'm sure, they have played that at some point. Well. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't believe anyone throws something out on the floor that they've never achieved. Um, and, and it just comes down to, I know, I, I bet you can get it. I bet you can get that snare lick when you have an hour to work on it with your snare tech on stands with the metronome. And they're like, they did it. <laughs> and, and that doesn't necessarily mean we can do it. And I think that's like one of the biggest things is, you know, me and Ian, we talk about all the time. It's like, what's the, what's the percentage? What's the ratio in which they're achieving it? Some things are okay taking risks, but there has to be a much higher ratio of them achieving it than just they never really get it. Um, and then that's when the changes have to start happening in, in well, any division. <laughs> very well stated. I think, I mean, in general, this activity keeps going back to quality trumps quantity every single time. And, and, and if you can give your students things to, that they can do with a great deal of quality, uh, that's the most valuable thing you can give them. I mean, like scores and numbers and placements and all that stuff aside, if you can give them something that they can do with a great deal of quality, um, you're giving them a wonderful experience, and, and that's the most important thing I think that we can do. Hey, um, John, you and I have known each other for a really long time, and we've both been doing this activity for a long time, way back in the day when I don't think either one of us knew what the heck we were doing. Um, can you share with me, um, with all the success that you've had over the years, what are some of the things that you wish you could go back and tell that younger version of yourself in the activity? Uh, you know, well, we don't have time for that. That's uh, well. <laughs> uh, the, the the biggest thing for me is I feel like that I I went through this pretty much the hardest way you could go through this. Um, which, if I so the first thing I would tell my younger self is you need to march. You need to march more for sure. You need to um, get as much experience actually doing the thing before you decide you're going to teach everyone to do the thing, which seems super obvious <laughs> until you didn't do it. But to be fair, my younger self didn't know this is what I was going to be doing. So it's like this this catch-22. But um, I feel like I mean, my actual experience was mostly just playing percussion in college and getting my degree, and at the very last second, um, just it, rooking out, you know, at the local drum corps of Pacific Crest, and so I was able to get a, just a tiny bit of experience, which was obviously extremely helpful. But I wish I could have done it more. I mean, there's just no other way around it. Um, not that you want to. You know, like, I think there's benefits to like essentially trying to figure it all out on your own. Um, it takes a lot longer, and you can you have to learn through trial by error for a long time. So I guess it's more gratifying in some ways, but <laughs> not the easiest journey. So that, that's the big one. Um, and I know, like when I first started teaching, I was, you know, I'm like, I, I have to make money. I mean, I have to pay rent. I, I have to. I'm an adult. I'm a college graduate. And I, I wish, even at that point, I maybe would have volunteered more. You know, I would have just gone to those better programs, asked. Can I even just attend rehearsals? Can I see what's going on? Um, can I maybe help out? There's got to be something I can do, right? You know, I can watch some feet, or I can, I can. There's some. There, there has to be some value, but just so I can absorb, you know, some of the information that's getting out there instead of just having to figure it out almost by myself. Um, that's the other big one. And I know sometimes people, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people we work with now, and some of these these recent age apps are just so. You know, they're so concerned about the paycheck, which which I absolutely understand, of course. But getting out and working side by side with some of the some of the best in the business, there's just there's nothing better for long term um, growth. Um, the biggest thing is, which is sort of the same thing, but I, I feel like I did finally find some mentors later. I wish I would have done that earlier, which I guess is the same sort of situation. But by the time I finally met someone that was like. Basically, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I was a few years deep into teaching full time. So, and then, and then those are the people you remember, and then that, those are the those are the paths where everything changes. And now it's time to understand 
exactly what you've been doing wrong. Um, one of the biggest things when I, when I remember doing some of those clinics a while back was it just took so many years to figure out the WGI philosophy and to figure out basically everything we were just talking about. But you know, with the Pacifica thing, it was in the beginning, every single year, the less amount of notes we played, the more successful we were. Very much boom, 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 all the way until we won WGI. And it, <laughs> you, you don't know that as a young person. You just, you just, you think we're going to play all the notes. We're going to get them all. And it's, we're going to be the best. And you can't understand why, you know, not everyone's on your side. And slowly but surely, as things become more musical. And it's also, I, I wish, I wish I wouldn't have approached in the beginning marching percussion as marching percussion. Um, and I wish I would have just used what everything I had as a drum set player, a songwriter, and uh, um, a college you know, degree <laughs> percussionist. I, I wish I would have used all of that a little bit more right off the bat, but there's something that happens to marching percussion that we, we think there's a certain way to do something. Um, and we kind of abandon all of our, our musical training and just <laughs> common sense about musicality and phrasing and you know, <laughs> all of these things. Like, we would practice with metronomes in college, but then at first we weren't practicing. Like I wasn't even teaching with a metronome. It's like th things like that just don't make any sense. You don't have to start from, from absolute scratch um, with all the resources. Of course, this is before YouTube, and <laughs> it was a different time. Let's just say I, I feel super old right now, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the big one, and. Um, I guess the other thing is, you know, doing the activity for for so much longer now. Um, you you you're you're very competitive usually when you're younger, but you also don't you're not very understanding. And um, once you once you're doing this long enough, you realize even the judges maybe the right or wrong, they're just they're humans and it's their opinions. And everyone's opinions are going to be different. And some people are going to like what you're doing, and some people aren't going to like what you're doing. And it doesn't mean they're wrong or you're wrong. It, it just means that that's where we're at. And once you realize that, and then you decide, wait a minute, what? that sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We're not trying to do everything for the judges. Like at, at a certain point, I have to do things that I, that I actually like, whether they're all with me or they're, or they're not with me. Um, so th the understanding that it's just people's opinions. It's not a sports game. You know, these, these scores can change at any moment, any time. And it doesn't really affect your day-to-day -day life. <laughs> um, probably one of the biggest things. So, well stated. Very well stated. Hey, um, John, we've got a whole bunch of questions that have come in, so we'll just kind of okay. take these off uh, one by one. And uh, and everybody that's uh, with us live, if there are other things on your brain that uh, you'd like to to pick John's brain about, uh, feel free to type in a question. Um, Eric is asking, how do you balance putting show on the floor and balance that with skills training or visual and musical and technical training, uh, those kinds of things. So that's like the first part of his question. And then he's also wondering what a typical Chino Hills rehearsal breakdown would be between um, skill development, skill training, and then getting the show on the show rehearsal. Yeah. So, no, no, I, I mean, that's a really good question. And the answer is sort of simple, where we... Specifically at Chino Hills, especially as the visual game has changed so much, just I feel like all of a sudden, <laughs> in the past couple of years, we've really pushed ourselves in the summertime. The summertime is where we train how to play the drum. That's when we get all of our fundamentals down, all of our exercises. We do start working on the music, but it's not a priority. The priority is drumming. And we always talk about this. By the time we start band camp, we need to be fully functional top end percussion ensemble. At least with our with our exercises. We can't still not be able to play roles or paranoids. Like we we have to check those things off the list as soon as possible. Um, and then we use the fall, we would just push really, really hard in the fall musically because that's all we're doing. I mean we're marching, but we're not doing we're not doing choreography. We're 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 starting to finally get ourselves like almost forcing ourselves to do more simultaneous responsibility in the fall just to get that training um, in sooner. Because even with the great Chino Hills, we, we'll, we'll be drumming great in the fall, and, and we start adding just a little bit of simultaneous responsibility those first couple of rehearsals, and it's like, 
we just reverted back you know, a division or two. And it's like, guys, well, I guess, I guess we haven't actually worked on this. I guess this is sort of new. Um, so we, we try to do some more of that in the fall. But the most, the biggest thing we do there is it's all about laying that foundation of the fall. And it doesn't mean we, we got to the last show and we pulled off the lick. That's, that's not at all what it is. We, we, we've, especially the past two or three years, been very adamant about we need to be finals ready a month before finals. And we have to learn to maintain that and like push ourselves like we would do at the end of winter season. And it's, it's more of a motivational thing than a teaching thing for sure. And through setting that up, then it's time to focus on WGI. And we don't, we simply don't get a drum as much in WGI um, in our rehearsals. We, we, the visual focus is extreme. And now we're, I mean, in the fall, we do, <laughs> in our, vi our visual day, we go off and drum on the other field. So it, we, we almost, I don't want to say we don't train visually in the fall, but it, it's very minimal and it's, we're just on the move and we're talking about marching and we're making sure everyone's catching up. But in the winter, there's just, I mean, it's almost what, probably 50% of the time it's, it's a visual conversation. Maybe, that, maybe not quite that high, but it feels like that, especially relative to the time we're drumming in the fall. Um, and we, we, tell, we tell the members every year, we're like, you know, it's coming. It's coming. You guys know it's coming. Like, we're not going to have this time to be, you know, like in the fall, we can take a rehearsal. We rehearse three days a week. So sometimes it's like, hey, we're just going to work on exercises tonight. Like, we would never, ever get a chance to do that for second semester. So the biggest thing is trying to make sure that you're basically – ready as possible by the end of fall, which is, of course, easier said than done, um, so that you can really focus on things. Because now the music's going to get harder, the visual's going to get harder, um, and the pressure's going to be on, and there's no band, and <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's a seven-minute drum solo. So I, I, don't, I don't remember the second half of the question, but that's... He was wondering what a typical Chino Hills rehearsal breakdown might be. Like, let's say you've got a three-hour yeah. rehearsal or something like that. How much time do you spend... On fundamentals or warming up, how much time do you spend on yep. uh, visual warm up or a block or fundamentals versus rehearsing in a full ensemble setting? Yeah, yeah, we we have, we generally rehearse um, we rehearse two two rehearsals a week, five to nine every Tuesday and Thursday. Should be there right now, actually. Uh, but <laughs> um, we we maximize that time. We don't load it up. We don't like if we're going to do ensemble. We're gonna we're gonna basically warm up for an hour. Um, well, warm up, play the music, and then we have like a half an hour to get props, stretch, floor, everything set up, and we just try to get as much ensemble time as possible. That's like a general, I guess, ensemble night. We typically, if I'm gonna do, if we're gonna do a visual project, we're just gonna devote a whole night to it um, because it's just it just takes a lot of time to do it right, and it's hard to transition. Maybe like, well, we're going to do an hour of drumming, and then an hour of visual basics, and then I'm going to teach an hour of drill, and then we're going to do an hour of marching and play, and it just doesn't really seem to happen like that. And when we do try to do that, it gets a little rushed. Um, but that's all now, that's all this like preseason time. As these shows start kicking in at the weekend, we do more ensemble, and we do more splitting it in half. But we try not to limit time too much. Um, if we're going to have like tonight, they're doing a four-hour block on the very end of the show. It's only about... 40 seconds of music, but we could split that in half, or we could just totally maximize that time, and they're going to know that music really well. Like yesterday, we did a big block, and we just learned the end of the show visually. So I, I don't know. That's how we tr that's how we try to break it up. If that helps. Yep. Um, Sarah has kind of like a follow up question to this. She was wondering, uh, not Chino Hills, but the independent groups instead. How do you maintain that balance for an independent group who hasn't been together during the summer? and only rehearses on weekends in terms of the technique and the foundation and things like that. <laughs> everything is harder at the independent groups. <laughs> Absolutely everything. And you think it's not because they're older, typically. Um, I mean, like, just facility, it's, it's everything. But I, I, know what you're, I know what she's asking. What she's, <laughs> it, it's, it's tough. And I, I will say that we, I get pulsed, we probably... We do need to we play our exercises more often than maybe Chino Hills would. Not that Chino Hills is better. We've been drumming for a year straight on the same exercises. So we know that we don't have to do that. With the independent group, they can't 
like Paul's, they, they, we can't rehearse during the week. I mean, they all live everywhere. It's, it's impossible. From Arizona to San Diego to Fresno. So they all show up Friday night, and then it's time to kind of dust off the hands and open up the ears and get things going. Um, so we do spend a lot more time on the fundamentals, actually, at the independent group, which is which is kind of interesting. I never really thought about that exactly like that. And we, and we do we do a, a preseason, um, which I think might be more common than now than it was, but we do auditions, auditions at the end of September, beginning of October, and we'll just do Sundays. And the Sundays are just strictly fundamentals. So it's the same sort of thing. We, and it is the same, same uh, philosophy of set it all up in the beginning because we're not going to have that time in the end. I, I will concur with everything John said. The independent thing is so much harder than <laughs> I mean, all, like facilities and logistics and parent support that doesn't exist and all that stuff, but also just the amount of time that you spend together, the lack of familiarity, uh, the lack of number of hours of, uh, you know, that you've logged as an ensemble, it makes it challenging. Um, the best thing to have there are fully committed members that are willing to woodshed some of that stuff on their own in between those rehearsals or uh, take the feedback you give them regarding technique or interpretation uh, and then go work that out themselves until it's corrected. Um, and sometimes you're dealing with, uh, you know, musicians that have the experience necessary to be able to do that on their own. So that, that's the one saving grace, I think, uh, for trying to give it a go with the independent thing. Um, Jeff was wondering, uh, he's kind of piggybacking off of one of the Percussion 101 things that you did on the Vic Firth site. He said, I've seen the spreadsheet that was presented in the Percussion 101 series on Vic Firth's site. Do you use something similar during the season? Something like, we need to have drill done by this date, or a run in full uniform and props needs to happen by this date. Hmm. I think he's talking about just the general writing timeline we did. Just because that's such a big part of it all. If you don't have the music on time, then everything else is, is secondary. Um, yeah, do you have a similar uh, timeline in terms of like production or getting things on the floor or you know dress rehearsal dates and that kind of stuff? Um. Not as official, but I think also because we just have been doing it sort of the same way for a long time. Um, I, I guess the short answer is no. I don't have a schedule on, on what we do. Um, but it, it's always it, – it's, it's tough too because it's always evolving. It's always changing. It's like even hard to say what are we – like a good week for me is I know what we're doing this day, that day, and that day. But – it always depends. Like, did we finish the, the visual? Or did we fill in the body? Or do we did? So the micro is always changing. But I guess the macro is not changing. Um, our biggest thing, I know that I, one of our biggest things we, we do at Chino Hills, relative to a lot of the groups I, I feel like we work with, is we don't ensemble as much as you would probably guess. Um, especially in the beginning, we really maximize our time um, apart. We really get like. When the front ensemble, I mean, they're on their own so much when they show up. It's like it's just kind of plug and play, um, and we're not stopping to like really work on much. It's it's really a true ensemble, um, and I think that's one of our maybe our biggest. I don't know. You have, you have to have really good teachers, and the music has to be written in a way where you can do that because um, it has to basically be written to work. Is where you if you're going to be a part that much. Um, so that that's a big part. But just deciding when those ensemble rehearsals is. But basically, it's. A, a, Long story short, you would just start at the end of the season and work everything backwards. I mean, I know when my regionals are. I go to I go to every regional I can, which is just the two we have, um, and everything is based off those two regionals and where we need to be. And I know realistically I'm not going to have the whole show down to the first regional. I, I, I've, I've tried here and there just as almost to see if I could, and it's it's not realistic. <laughs> um, but we get pretty close. Um, so, but I, I guess as a rule of thumb. Um, we, anytime, like if it's, if it's at the high school and if there's a show that week, we're, we're not learning anything during those rehearsals. That's probably one of the most helpful things. There are others, oh, and if, and if it's the first show, it's like, okay, we can keep pushing. I can keep, I can have a vis block and Ian can do his thing. But once we get two weeks out from the show, it's, that's it. It's like, you have to stop and we have to take that time to prepare for the show. Um, we never want to get just caught off guard. We never want to throw, you know, people in the gym unprepared. So I guess it's it's so much based off when your competitions are too. I don't know if that helps. Oh, definitely. Uh, 
first of all, Tori says that he works at the beach, so if he would like both you and I to come out and help, I'm down, Tori. Just drop me an email. John into it as well. Uh, so, beach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Tori is wondering this, uh, and I'll kind of I'll give you my two thoughts, Tori, and then if John has a little bit that he'd like to add, I'm sure he can jump in as well. Uh, Tori was wondering this. My circuit is very small, and there are only two groups in our class. We're attending a WGI regional, but that doesn't provide much competition for our class in terms of variety of groups. We haven't been to Dayton in quite a few years, but we want to come back to compete. How would you prepare the kids to handle more competition when the area does not provide it? Um, I, Tori, this is a, a, a concern that I know a lot of groups around the country face because uh, where they are, there's just not a lot of head-to-head -head competition. For them. I think this kind of gets back to uh, one of the things that's really valuable to me, which is I always talk to my students about competing with themselves um, and about that being the most important thing that they do so that it, it really doesn't matter a whole lot whether or not we see uh, one other person in our class or ten other ensembles in our class. We have a certain set of goals that we've set out for ourselves in terms of the performance and we are trying to achieve those goals at a, you know, every single performance every single week. Um, so I think regardless of where you are geographically in the country, that's true no matter what. Um, and then I think your intuition outside of that is exactly spot on. Try to travel to a regional when you can to see maybe one or two other groups that you haven't seen before. Or if you can, go to a different regional, one that's even a little bit further away. It'll be more expensive, it'll be more challenging, yes. Uh, but maybe you get the chance to see some groups that, that you haven't seen recently. Uh, those are the best things to do to help get you in get your students some experience. Uh, but I think the best ensembles would still be fantastic ensembles, even if they weren't competing head-to-head -head with others. Um, I think about great programs like uh, like Dartmouth, who has been yep. <laughs> almost the inception. Um, and that's without you know head-to-head -head competitors down the street. Um, I know, I don't want to speak for Tom too much, but I know that he sets goals for his program in terms of the excellence he wants them to have. And then they just do it, and they show up at World Championships, and they're always one of the best groups every single year. So, um, you know, if, if Dartmouth can do it, I think anybody can uh, in terms of just setting your own standard and, and trying to accomplish that all the time. Um, the other sliver that I have to this is I'm not sure if there's anything that will prepare a group really for WGI World Championships other than being there and experiencing it. I don't think there's any experience you can give your students in terms of regional that prepares them for going up against the best of the best from all over the world. Um, so World Championships to me has become this insane thing that only exists for one week. It's my favorite week of the year. And uh, it, it's so insane and so crazy because there's nothing else like that weekend when everybody finally all gets together. So um, you know, really you gotta get your group there and, and be able to experience it to get better and better and better at kind of having that experience. I don't know, John, you have anything, any thoughts to add on to that? I think you nailed it. I, it, it it's, a, it's a mindset also as the teacher. I mean, for example, Chino Hills was at the regional this past weekend by ourselves in our division. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I didn't do anything differently because of that. We didn't try, not try as hard <laughs> um, throughout the week. I mean, it, and honestly, it almost like it was almost at the end of the regional where I was like, oh, yeah, we were by ourselves. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of the way you, you go about it. But for me, the regionals are, are just so valuable because you're guaranteed to have that, that WGI panel. Um, and whether you're going to Dayton or not, I mean, that's that's the best of the best. That's what that's what it's going to be. Um, and now it's just pretty rare you're going to get four WGI judges on the same panel unless you go to a regional. Um, so for, for and it's really more about the commentary and it's and it's you know the numbers they're definitely. I mean, they're not. It's not an exact science, of course, across the country. But even if you're regional by yourself, your your number gives you a solid idea of where you're at. So there's definitely value in going for sure. Outside of that, the only other thing I would do is I would encourage uh, movie nights with your ensemble, an opportunity where you get a chance to watch other ensembles that might be out of your region. Um, just even if it's old archival copies of WGI DVDs. Uh, or stuff that you can find, you know, pulling it up on YouTube or something like that. That's a great way to uh, increase their exposure to other groups that are out there and the way other groups go about performing and, and, and the kinds of shows that are out there. So um, I think that's kind of a good, trip, uh, a good tip for expanding the horizons of the students that you have um, if you don't have that built-in network of, of groups to kind of compete against. 
Um, Aaron had a question for you, John, about um, your set design and things like that. He said, do you ever not use part of your set at performances due to the size restrictions of the competition venue? How do you balance designing for the space in Dayton versus the space that you'll have regionally and locally in those venues? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, well, I, I think no matter what, we basically have to design it to, to work in the smaller space since most of our shows are in the smaller space. Um, I mean, most of our, our gyms in California are small, smaller, I guess, and they basically barely fit the SCPA floor, which is 65 by 90, right? Pretty sure. So we have to squeeze world-class ensembles onto this floor, but we're trying to, you know, set it up for the big room, which you understand because you're asking the question. I don't, I don't know that I've ever done not done something at, at a small show. I think we somehow just cram it in. And sometimes there's little penalties. There's, there's people that are too far back or sometimes the sides, even though that seems to not be a thing now. Or it's, it's almost like if you're, if you're going to – it's worth the read. It's, I don't know, the, the penalty thing or if you can squeeze it in the gym, I say you do it. I mean, that, that's just where it's at. And if, if, you, if you take a couple penalties, it doesn't really matter. You really just look at the commentary and the experience of the read. Um, I don't know if that's an official WGI stance to take all the penalties, but uh, I guess I've never been in a situation where I couldn't do it. We were pretty close on 15 with those tenor towers at Chino Hills, and we almost couldn't get him into a couple venues. <laughs> um, but luckily, we squeezed him in. So I guess... I guess the answer is no. We, we don't do anything different. Um, we just look a little ridiculous in the small gyms. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I think the important thing to do is to make sure that the key components of your set design are going to work no matter what venue you're in. The WJ Rulebook says you got to be prepared to perform within uh, 60 by 90 space. So uh, make sure that there's a version of your show that fits perfectly in 60 by 90. And in some of those larger venues, if you want to add components to that, or you know, if you have a small footprint version, but if we, we have enough space, then we kind of expand this, and this gets staged over here, um, you can certainly do that. But uh, the, all the most savvy designers out there design for the smallest venue that they're going to be in, and they make sure that there's a way for all the key ingredients to work, um, and then that scales as, as need be over the course of the season. But good question. Um, let's see. This is a really good one. Garrett was wondering how you balance your day-to-day -day schedule between writing and rehearsals. Do you have a steady schedule that you always go with, or does it kind of flex based on creative sparks and, and you know, ideas and epiphanies that you get, things of that nature? Um, I mean, it, there's there's no daily schedule for sure. It's it's there's just so many factors all the time. Um, I, I, it's different for me because I, I only write like I I teach one school and mainly one independent group as far as rehearsals, um, and I'm home all week basically writing and working. So, um, but if I go back to if I go back to that's the luxury now. So if I go back to when I was really teaching and, and like I was very structured and there was like very hard deadlines for sure because if I didn't get the deadline done and they, they, they wouldn't have the music. Um, now we try to take advantage of, of just writing earlier. That's our, our, our absolute, that's our big thing. It, it's, there, there's no downside to, to starting sooner unless you feel like you're rushed. And then if you feel like you're rushed, you just can slow down because you're starting so early. Um, so I don't know if that helps. I, <laughs> I don't have a daily routine right now. It's just kind of like what's the most important thing, and that's, that's what we work on. Absolutely. Hey, um, we've got one other question here that I want to get to and uh, and answer it. I've got some thoughts, and, and John might as well. Uh, Chris is wondering what we think about middle schools competing in high school divisions at regionals. Uh, is that too early for those students to be having that experience, or you know, just what do you say? Go for it. Um, I think in general, Chris, that you know the scholastic classes are most commonly filled by by high school groups, uh, but there's no stipulation that says those are supposed to be high school classes. They're scholastic, so. That can be a middle school class as well. Um, I know of a handful, not like dozens and dozens, but a handful of junior high groups that regularly compete um, at, at WGI regionals. And I know that there are, are, are many, many more than that, that that participate in their local circuit. 
I think uh, bringing them to a regional and having them gain that experience would be a wonderful thing for those students uh, as long as you put everything in the proper context. As long as it is an experience uh, playing for some of the finest adjudicators and evaluators in the country, um, as long as you talk to them about uh, perhaps taking the show on the road, maybe you go to a, region, or a regional that's slightly outside of your area and you talk about the fun trip involved, um, as long as you don't make it a competitive thing and you, as long as you, you, you let them know that that's not where the value is. Hey, we're not going here to earn um, you know, this score or to beat so-and-so or, or anything like that. As long as you're giving them the proper context, I think it's a very valuable experience. I will say um, that middle school students are, are, are highly impressionable um, and certainly will read between the lines on lots of things. So it's really important that you not take for granted that, oh yeah, I'm sure they understand that we're going up against high school groups and stuff like that. No, you really got to take the time to give them the right context. Uh, but if you do, there are phenomenal things that they're capable of at, at regionals um, and phenomenal experiences that they can have. So I think given the right context, it can be a valuable and healthy thing for them. Yeah, I think it, I think it, it depends on how um, just your local circuit is. Like our local circuit is so strong with SCPA that our, our junior high feeder just, they, they get to go to a local show and they see all the groups and it, it's a great experience. Um, so if, if it's a trip to see more groups, then it, it would make sense to go to a, a regional. Um, but if it's, uh, I don't know. The main thing is, you, you do want, I mean, our junior high kids that feed into the Chino Hills, when they get to go and watch Chino Hills and Arcadia and where she's seeing everybody, I mean, it's just, that's it. And then they show up ready to go, show up excited. So it's super important that they see good groups. There's no question about that. All right, give me one last thing. Okay, very good. Um, so I think we, we've got several other questions here, but some of them are really large questions that would take a long time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of save some of these and we'll use these as topics for uh, future webinars that we have. Um, so what I want to do really quickly is plug for everybody that the next one of these that we are going to have will be March 14th on Tuesday. Our special guest that evening is going to be Tom Hunt, so we can get into particulars about, uh, about Dartmouth High School and some of his uh, experiences in the activity. Um, so those of you guys that asked questions today that we weren't able to get to, I'll see if I can work those into uh, some additional sessions down the road. Um, also, I want to plug that if you have particular questions that you'd like uh, for Tom and I to get into and discuss on March 14th, um, you can send me a quick email with any of that stuff ahead of time and we can kind of use that in some of our notes and our planning for that. And uh, the final thing I want to do is thank you so much, John, for being here with us tonight. Um, John bailed out of a rehearsal, everybody, so that he could be here and, and give you guys some feedback and participate in this. So, John, on behalf of everybody else that tuned in tonight, I want to thank you very much for doing that. I want to thank you for, for uh, spending some time with us um, and for sharing all of your insight and wisdom. Great. It was fun. Glad you had me. Absolutely. All right, everybody, thank you very much. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. All right.